Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 28 of From Paper to People, Ancestors Alive Genealogies podcast with an attitude of gratitude mixed with latitude, but never platitudes and occasionally a little ratitude. This week, we have an interview that I've been anticipating for a while. I am a total fangirl for our guest. Imagine my surprise when I learned that she's actually a listener, but we'll get there in a minute. First, I want to thank David Mee and Rick Leonard for joining the podcast as monthly patrons through Patreon and Jean-Pierre Jordan as a one-time donor through Kofi or coffee or whatever the heck they call it. Somebody eventually is going to have to establish that for me so I don't sound like such an idiot. Anyway, I appreciate your support, all three of you. Thank you so much for coming and joining us. Okay, now we're ready to roll and I am psyched. If you spend any time around professional genealogists, you know Amy Johnson Crow. On Twitter alone, she always posts interesting and approachable how-to articles from her own blog, amyjohnsoncrow.com. She shares a lot of terrific articles from other people. She retweets and supports folks regardless of their status in the genealogy world. She participates in hashtag discussions like GenChat, and she starts her own hashtag trends to spark activity and discussion in the community. In real life, she's an international speaker. She participates on panel discussions and gives seminars. And today, she visited me via the interwebs while I was in my pajamas to talk about indexing and arbitrating records through FamilySearch. Please note that she does not work for FamilySearch, but she has worked with them in past on projects. And because she's knowledgeable, I thought she'd be ideal for the topic. Settle in for some fun pumpkins because here's Amy. Well, everybody, here it is. I am fangirling out because we have with us today, Amy Johnson Crow. Welcome to the show, Amy. Well, thank you. I am thrilled to be here, Carolyn. Ah, so... Amy is here with us today to talk about indexing and arbitrating records, specifically on family search. So what's your experience with indexing and arbitrating records? Well, my experience with family search indexing actually goes back to about the time of the dinosaurs. <laughs> um, and I, I say that only half jokingly because I was involved in a project back in the 1990s. Okay, if you can imagine such a thing. <laughs> back, back in the, let's see, we started in 1995. Mm -hmm. And I was involved with a project that was, well, it's, it's now known as the Civil War Soldiers and Sailor System. Mm -hmm. And it was a project that was spearheaded by the National Park Service, Family Search, which wasn't going by the name of Family Search back then, I don't think. I mean, that tells you how long ago this has been, uh, the Federation of Genealogical Societies and, and several other organizations. And the goal was to create an index of Civil War soldiers and sailors. And how we did this, you're going to laugh at the technology, but it worked. Okay. Okay. So the index cards to the compiled service military records. You know, each soldier, each sailor is supposed to have one of these compiled service military records. And somebody, you know, way, way, way back in the day created an index to them. This is like the, the most logical thing to do if you want to create an index of all of the Civil War soldiers and sailors. I mean, it's, it's right there. But you need to get it into some sort of database. Okay. So what they did was they took these dozens and dozens and dozens of rolls of microfilm that had these cards and they blew them back to paper. Okay. Okay. So then volunteers with the project and, and I was in charge of coordinating the state of Ohio, which had just a few people in the civil war. What we did was we sent, I think it was a hundred sheets of paper, which equaled 200 records to all of the indexing volunteers. Mm -hmm. They had to load a piece of software onto their computer and they would save it to, get a load of this, a three and a half inch diskette. 
<laughs> I remember those. Yeah, remember those? <laughs> okay, so so here I am. I have all of these batches. Okay, they, they were called batches back then. And each volunteer that, that I was kind of coordinating, I would mail them a set of batches and a set of three and a half inch diskettes because each batch had to be saved to a different diskette because what they would do when they were done indexing it, they would mail it back to me, not email, physical mail. I would check it back in and then I would turn around and mail it to somebody else for them to index it. So we had two blind indexes. So then after that one batch had been indexed by two people, then myself and, and a few other the volunteers, we would arbitrate it. And what we had to do was actually take these three and a half inch diskettes, copy the file onto our computers into the program we had, and it would tell us where it was different. And then we had to tell was A right or was B right. And then when we were done arbitrating, we would take our file and we would send it back. Now, this yeah. explains to me why it is that the terminology that Family Search and the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter day Saints now uses in order to be able to do the work that they do currently with indexing and arbitrating and having two layers of indexing. Mm -hmm. plus arbitration before releasing a set of records into gen pop, as it were, into the general population and into usage, both right. on family search and ultimately frequently into Ancestry.com. Right. So the, the process has changed considerably since 1995. We had, you know, for, for a long time, you know, it was actually from physical diskettes. Then we moved into desktop where you still had to download an indexing program to your computer. Right. But you could download the batches as digital images on your computer. Now, I which, was there for that. Yeah, okay, which, so oh my gosh, that, that in and of itself was like, you know, the, the heavens opened and the angels <laughs> voiced. <laughs> I mean, seriously, you should have seen my garage because I had hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of these batches. It was, it was insane. So, and my mailman loved me. <laughs> he really did. He loved me. So, so then, like I said, it moved into the, into the desktop indexing. Well, now we're into web indexing and it's changed a little bit because what FamilySearch has found out from, you know, all these years of indexing, they found that it really wasn't gaining that much to always do two blind entries. So now we have the review process. And indexing, you know, once you've been indexing for a while, and I forget how many records or how many batches you have to have indexed to qualify to do review, but there is a process. You know, you have to be an experienced indexer to qualify to do review. But the review, that's really where projects get hung up. Because people are super confident, you know, indexing is like, oh, yeah, I, I can index. But people are afraid to review. But we still need the review because it needs, it's that quality assurance so that there are good records that end up being searchable. And that's why, you know, we really need to get more people who have been doing indexing for a while to start downloading review batches and get those done. And this is how we got into this conversation in the first place. We were on Twitter the other day, and as usual, I was complaining because that's what I do. <laughs> I go on to <laughs> I go on to Twitter and I whine just a little bit about this, that, or the other. And I was complaining about the fact that controllability of the record. That was it. I was yeah. I was mad at the fact that and I always am mad at this. This is one of the things that irks me in general about ancestry versus family search and why I do have a kind of a binary thing in my head in ancestry when there's an error in the record 
and you're going to add the record over into your tree and you have that two column setup where the record is on the left and your tree is on the right whatever is incorrect in the record as it's going to be added over into your tree you can correct the spelling or you can correct it initial or you can nick out a period or a comma or whatever that isn't supposed to be there so that whatever shows up in your tree on the right in the ultimate addition of the record is correct so that you don't have to add stuff over that looks like it's been through a blender but if you do that in family search you cannot change what's being added over it is purely the way that it has been indexed and if it's been indexed like mud then you just can't do anything about it and that's very frustrating as an end user so i was complaining about that and i was complaining about that and it was either to you or <laughs> you picked me up and kind of grabbed me by the scruff of the neck i'm not really sure which but it was pretty funny either way and um, you know, it was it was a it was a gentle pickup by the scruff of the neck <laughs> and amy's response to me was so why don't you arbitrate then <laughs> And um, <laughs> yeah, and and I've been doing this for you know for so long that you know I'm still stuck in the old terminology. I mean, but that's what they still tell them. Yeah, and I've always wondered why, and now I understand why yeah. because it's the next step up for him indexing. Once a thing has been indexed, then it has to be looked at by somebody who knows sort of more about what they're doing before it can be released to the general population, and that's called arbitration. So let's backtrack for a minute and let's talk about indexing a record. The process of indexing a record is taking a piece of paper, scanning it in, and forming what is basically like a JPEG, right? Some kind mm -hmm. of a, a, a scanned image. Right. And then taking that scanned image and putting that information into a database so that eventually it becomes digitized information that's searchable and usable by an end user in either Ancestry or MyHeritage or um, I don't even know, I don't even use Wikitree, so I don't even know if it's, if that's a place that records show up, but certainly in family search. That's about the size of that? Yeah, that, that's, that's pretty much the indexing process in a nutshell. I mean, family search will acquire records from various archives, libraries, what have you. But like you said, to make them searchable, there has to be something for us to search against and you really can't search against just an image there has to be some sort of data there so family search will figure out what information out of this record would be helpful in an index and so they'll decide okay for these well i was working on a collection last night it was a set of abstracted obituaries from a town in Indiana, and I, I think that they got them either from the Historical Society or the library, that they had compiled years and years and years of these little, you know, three by five cards where they have abstracted the obits from the local newspaper. So they decided, okay, we are going to index not only the name of the deceased and all of their biographical information that appears in there, you know, the, the birth date and place, the death date and place and the age, things like that, but we're also going to index all of the relatives mentioned in this obituary. Nice. Yeah, it's super, super cool. So, so there's that decision process of what data they're going to collect. And then it's a matter of getting those records digitized, getting them scanned, and then getting them into the indexing program, process, queue, whatever they're going to call it, so that volunteers then can download a batch and then they can work on them, get them indexed, somebody can review them, and then eventually the whole thing will be searchable on Family Search and, as you said, you know, sometimes other partner organizations as well. Now, the main place to go if you want to be a volunteer to do indexing work is familysearch.org. And yes. Family Search, so that people know. I hear people saying stuff, I particularly, Twitter is the place to go if you wanna see the goss. If you wanna see the gossip, okay, and all of the kind of backbiting, infighting, whatever else is going on in the family, you've got to go to Twitter because Twitter is the place to see what's happening. And 
people talk about and sometimes talk down, which kind of makes me mad, Family Search, because I don't talk it down so much as I try to be accurate about its shortcomings. I think it's really intelligent to assess what's right and what's wrong about every possible service, because as you get to know what it is that's really true about the strengths and weaknesses of every possible service, then you can use each service for the things that it's meant to do, good for, and then avoid the things that it's not so good for. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, I I hear a lot of people saying, well, I don't use Family Search because I don't want people changing my tree. It's like, uh, do you realize that Family Search has more than a tree? Yeah. You know, we have, you know, a few billion records over here that you might want to take a look at for free. Thank you very much. Not to mention that it's not your tree, folks. It's a tree. Right. It's one tree. Yeah. That's, That's what I keep trying to tell folks. Ancestry is your own specific room that you've created that you can either lock or unlock. You can let people in, you can let people see in through the window, or you can absolutely make it hermetically sealed. But Family Search is one world tree, my friends. It is a tree for the whole planet. And so, yeah, you know, if people make changes to it, they may actually be corrections. They may be changes that you get mad at because they're wrong, in which case you can kick it upstairs to the family. You can change it back. That's right. (laughs) You can actually report abuse because there is a little thing. It's a flag and it says report abuse. And you can report somebody who is repeatedly making changes that are incorrect and that are proven to be wrong by the documentation that you have provided. That's why you produce and attach documentation, proving your argument. I mean, that's the way that works. So all of that is kind of silly. But the thing is that people say stuff about family search. And as a member of the church, this is maybe part of the reason why I get kind of mad. And also I'm a temple and family history consultant for the church. I am a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I am an atypical one and I am pretty good at taking criticism, but it kind of makes me mad when people say stuff that's kind of a little bit ignorant. So I'm going to straighten you out on one thing, folks. Everybody listen. Family Search belongs to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. It was created for a couple of purposes. It was created for the church itself in order to serve our needs as a worship community. And then it was also created as a service for the entire planet. And it is possible for anyone who wants one to have a free membership. And that's pretty stinking groovy because let's face it, Ancestry doesn't give you that. There are some records on Family Search that you cannot find on Ancestry. There are way more records on Ancestry than there are on Family Search. That's why I always tell everybody build first on Ancestry, maximize what you can do on Ancestry, carry your data over to Family Search, and lo and behold, you will find things on Family Search that you cannot find on Ancestry. Sometimes, not always not guaranteed. But when people badmouth family search, it irks me because the indexed records, they come from family search. It's so cool. So I think that it's really important to know Ancestry doesn't offer you as a volunteer the opportunity to go in and say, hey, I'm going to get my hands dirty today or this week or this month. I'm going to give back I'm going to get in there and I'm going to make a pile of, you know, formerly microfilmed marriage certificates or something like that into something searchable that Family Search does. So Family Search is a great place to go if you want to kick in. Would you say? Yeah, definitely. And you know, the other thing that I really like about Family Search indexing, I mean, it's just it's great practice for reading old handwriting and getting into these records and seeing how they're put together. You know, you go into the, into, because each collection has a set of instructions and it tells you, okay, here's how this particular record needs to be indexed. And it'll go field by field explaining what needs to be indexed, what to include, what not to include, the things that are required. And if it's not there, you have to mark it blank. 
so you get really familiar with with these records. It's great practice to go in there and see how they're put together. What would you say is, of all of the collections that you've worked on, what are some of your favorite collections that you've gotten to see? You know, asking me, you know, favorite collections, that, that, that's kind of tough for any genealogist. I tell you, I had a ton of fun working on the 1940 census. That makes a lot of sense. Oh, my gosh. That was so fun. In fact, I was on the committee that helped decide how these were going to be indexed. At, at the time, I worked for a company called Archives.com, and Archives was the partner with the National Archives for getting the images up on the National Archives website. Well, we also entered what was called the consortium with Archives.com, Family Search, Find My Past, ProQuest, and the National Archives to actually get these records indexed. And it was so fascinating to see the decisions of, okay, are we going to index this one field? Are we going to index this field over here? And if so, you know, how much time was it going to add to the indexing process for each field that was going to be included? It was just the, the entire process was absolutely fascinating to me. And one of the things that I love most about that 1940 census, I mean, there was no way they weren't going to include it in the indexing, of course, was where were you in 1935? Exactly. Oh, it, I love that. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, <laughs> such, it's such a great question. And having that data in there, even if it's not searchable on the various websites where people took it, that data is still in there. And, you know, being able to have that big data later to do you know, study, and I was just, you know, I was just geeking out from a data standpoint. <laughs> <laughs> Hashtag data geek. <laughs> Hashtag genealogy nerd. Yeah, um, totally. It is, it is a great thing to be able to kind of be on the inside and to be able to see this kind of stuff. So what advice can you give to people who are looking to get dirty? <laughs> So, so getting down and dirty with the records, what I would do is sign up at FamilySearch, uh, you know, make, make your, your free FamilySearch account and go into, there's, there's a tab on the homepage where you can click on indexing to get started, watch the tutorials. I mean, it's super easy, you know, it, it's really easy to do, but start with a collection that you're probably going to feel comfortable with. Start with something that's in a language that you speak. Yes. Maybe start with a newer collection where the records are actually typewritten. Just so, just so you get a feel for how the program works, how you move from field to field, how you actually enter things. And no matter what collection you are working on indexing, take the time to go through and read the instructions. Because, I mean, seriously, the, the instructions there, you know, we kind of think, well, I've seen these records before. You know, I've, I've seen similar records in other states, other counties, other time periods. But each collection is going to be a little bit different. So take the time. It only takes you a couple minutes. And just get familiar with how that collection is put together and how they want it to be indexed. Yeah, and the indexing things, I mean, the guidelines really do differ from collection to collection. Some of them say specifically, do not add the punctuation if there is punctuation in the name. Like if there is R period as a, a give as a first name, you know, if it's if it's an initial as a first name, do not add the period, just add the letter. I mean, they get that specific and you don't want to slow down the arbitration process. So they want you to really follow directions. And this is where it went off the rails for a minute. Even though we were both plugged into the Ethernet and everything seemed fine, the connection suddenly froze. And with it, my brain. By the time Amy came back online, I had completely forgotten my follow-up question on arbitration because we were winging it. No list of questions as you do, and I couldn't make things fit together and match seamlessly before and after the freeze when I was editing because the conversation just 
didn't fit together. So instead, I'm here to fess up and to tell you that things do not always work perfectly in podcast land, even when you pre-record, but at least you can usually find cool sound effects to make it all worthwhile. So we shifted gears and moved on as only the Valiant do. Well, it may not come back. It may not be that important, I don't suppose. Sometimes I think it's not important because I was saying it anyway, so it's just not necessarily all that important. <laughs> Screen freeze and brain freeze, how they come so close together. Yeah. Um, okay, that's completely gone. Let's go to the questions. Okay. So I've got a couple of questions for you, and they're pretty great questions, I must say. They come from a couple of members of our Facebook group. And by the way, everybody, if you're not in the Facebook group and you listen to the podcast and you are on Facebook, you are so missing out. It is so much fun. We post pet pictures. I mean, we do not take ourselves too seriously. But by the same token, when people have serious questions about stuff, we give each other answers and we give each other guidance. And it's really, really funny. And really, really cool. And I like it. I think it's a very good group of people. So our first statement is from Sarah Crow. Sarah Crow is our other admin in the group. Um, we have 110 members at least. I think we have a few more than 110 by now. And Sarah Crow got her gig as soon as we were about a hair's breadth away from 100. And every 100 members were adding a new admin just to make sure that things stay flowing. I know of these groups that have like 3,000 members and they have like two admins and it's just stupid because nobody can keep up with anything. We're not doing that. So Sarah says, it's my goal for the last few months to index at least 200 records a month on Family Search, and I have really enjoyed it. Very much looking forward to this episode. So she's psyched to hear from you, Amy. And I just, I have to Latter-day Saint shame. Sarah is not a member of the church. So if you are, shame, shame, shame. Just had to throw that in there. Okay. Chris Olson is a member and she has a really interesting question because this is a question that I have wondered about because it's something that I've actually talked about in the podcast. When you discover an error in something that was indexed, what is the best way to go about getting it corrected through family search? What if the only reason you know something is incorrect is because it's your family and you know the info, but it looks like what was indexed? How do you best go about getting the index changed? For example, my ancestor Lemuel Lawrence is listed in the 1870 census as Samuel Lawrence. The L does look like an S, as Sa and Samuel is the more common name, but it is Lemuel. It has his family included on the census, living on the farm they lived at for decades, etc. So what she's saying is all the other data lines up with Lemuel's family, but the name is wrong. How does she fix that? To my knowledge right now, there isn't a good feedback for that. Um, unlike on Ancestry, where when you see something that has been indexed incorrectly or you have additional information that you can make an annotation to it, which does become searchable in Ancestry, right now there isn't that functionality on Family Search. I do know that they are looking at a way to do that, but they, I, I have no ETA or anything on that. I just, I know that that is on their radar. One thing to keep in mind, though, that with the indexing process, they don't have it fully in, in place yet, but they save. Let's say that, that the first person indexed it as Lemuel and the reviewer corrected it, and I put correct in air quotes, they corrected it to Samuel. Family Search is saving both of those values. Okay. It's, it's in a database somewhere. Currently, only the corrected value is searchable. But, oh. but yeah, but I've been talking to my, to my peeps over at Family Search, and, and, and they've been talking about this for quite some time, too, to actually make all of the values searchable. Well, now that would be magic. Yeah. 
Yeah, so I, I think that that also relieves some of the pressure on arbitrators and reviewers that, okay, you're not destroying data because they are still saving all of those values. It's just that currently only the corrected or the reviewed value is the one that's searchable. But my understanding is that they are working on a way to have all of the values be searchable. That's great. You know, for, if for no other reason than seeing all of the values in Ancestry can sometimes be really, really funny. Yeah. Like when there's one and the, the guy's name is Tom Ruff, R-U-F-F, and the initial indexing has his name as Palm Bofts. Okay. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, because this guy's name was definitely Palm. Okay, so yeah. yeah. Now, Chris's follow-up may actually be mooted at this point, but she says, secondly, say you get an error fixed on family search. Does that correction carry over to other websites that have the same sets of indexed records like Ancestry, or would a request for a correction need to go to each place you know of that has that record online? In other words, say, let's, let's go to find a grave. For instance, when you connect up a bunch of family members on find a grave so that um, instead of it just showing an individual person with no spouse and no children, you, you have a whole bunch of uh, family connected up so that there is spouse and a bunch of children. Periodically, there is some kind of a refresh process that goes on. And as a result of that refresh, a new find a grave citation shows up in Ancestry. And as a result of that, it is possible to derive an entire family group instead of just an individual from that one find a grave citation. So what Chris is asking is, does that family search correction do that same thing when that family search record branches out into Ancestry, I don't know whether it shows up on MyHeritage or not because I don't use MyHeritage, but I expect it does. Anyway, that kind of thing. Yeah, so so a couple different things at play there. One, you know, since we don't really have a way to make corrections after it's been posted on Family Search, that you know, that by itself is kind of a kind of a moot point. But we also need, and, and this is getting a little little technical, but there are two different ways that data can be shared between websites. You can have, let's say, Family Search actually giving a copy of a particular database to Ancestry. You could also have what's called an API, which allows two different websites to pull data from each other or allow one, one website to pull data from another website. And that would be done sort of, you know, automatically. So whatever change would be made on the one website would show up on the second one. So as to whether or not a correction made on one website will automatically appear on another website, it's going to depend on how they're sharing their information. And unfortunately, there's no universal answer for that. Okay. So... The nature of the relationship between Ancestry and Family Search is, is one that's a little bit murky and quite intriguing mm -hmm. to me and to many others. And perhaps that's something that will become clearer in the future. So I'm sorry that we don't have an answer for you, Chris, um, but she can always rattle my cage about that later. And, um, and as, as fellow members of the church, we can always complain about that later to one another because that's part of what we do when we're members of the church. Um, Besides which, she's only a state away from me. We could meet in New York City and we could, you know, like have a cup of something that the word of wisdom allows and we could complain to one another over that. So that's always good. Now, Stacey Ashmore Cole holds a special place in my heart because she is doing something truly extraordinary that I think you will appreciate. And really, I think that you will appreciate this, Amy. This is what she says. And this is how she joined the group by telling me this. This is so cool. I mean, not this particular post, but this project. I have been making indexes and finding aids for the Family Search Liberty County, Georgia probate documents. Now, she originally started this project on her own and offered it to Family Search, and they 
kind of said no. And she said, well, I'm doing it anyway. <laughs> so she does this Liberty County, Georgia probate documents. As you may remember, I approached them a about doing it for them since I'm doing it anyway. And they said there was no way to set it up for a volunteer to do a particular record set. So I put them online and linked to that on the family search wiki, but I still wish there was a way for them to use this work. So how does she, she, it's on the wiki, but she Mm -hmm. Volunteers, quite honestly, she, she wants to be tied into what they're doing, and what she's doing is actually reparational work. Right. Specifically, this is tying into probate work that shows in the wills people who had enslaved persons in their property exchanges. Is there right? A- and can- yeah, I mean it, that's that's a that's a fascinating project, and I I, I think that that the challenge of getting that particular project expanded to something bigger um, is going to be one, whether family search has, if they have rights to the images. Okay. Okay. So, so there's, you know, even, even if family search already has copies of the images, they may not have the permission to index them. Okay. All right. Okay. So, so, so there, so there's that. There's the issue of just bandwidth, and I, and I don't mean like internet bandwidth. I mean just, you know, in in the system being able to get the project in there, but also taking a look. Not all projects are really well suited to be indexed on the web because it's one thing to have a census or a book of of birth records, baptism records, um, three by five index cards that are typewritten, things that are pretty similar in format mm-hmm. where somebody can say, okay, I expect that in this column there's going to be this information or I expect on this three by five card the top line is always going to be the name of the deceased. Okay. Those are, those are pretty easy to, to look at and be able to pull information out of. On the other hand, if she's pulling information out of probate records, let's say just wills. Right. So suddenly you have documents that could be a couple paragraphs, could be a couple pages. It could be eight pages long. How do you know, how do you train somebody to be able to go through image by image by image by image and read the entire thing and know what to pull out? Okay, so in terms of pulling volunteers, that might not be the easiest project Ex- exactly. to put together. Right, but- and, and you also have the issue of something where, and, and again, just talking about wills, that wouldn't include the problem that you have of estates where there isn't a will and you're pulling this information out of other types of documents. Mm -hmm. So the way that the way that indexing works is that they can take these individual images, these individual records, and they can pretty much chop them up into standard sizes. Mm Mm-hmm. Okay, this, this one image contains two pages of this church ledger. So that's going to be one image. It stands alone by itself, okay? On the other hand, if you have, let's say, a roll of microfilm, how do you know where to chop it up? Right. When it's just page after page after page and not every will starts on a new page. Okay, very true. So, so okay. from, from a logistical standpoint, that, that type of project isn't going to be as web-friendly mm-hmm. as, as one would hope. That's the kind of project where you have to, like you said earlier, you have to get kind of down and dirty with the record, and that type of project doesn't really lend itself to, to indexing via the, the current system. 
Okay. And, and, and again, let's, let's, I, I feel like I, I should add this little, this little caveat in here. I am not affiliated with Family Search. Right. I'm, I'm just a happy, happy user. <laughs> and, you know, I have, I have friends who work at Family Search and I, uh, I love the work that, that Family Search as an organization is doing. But, you know, I just want to, you know, throw that out there that I'm just giving this from my perspective of being involved with several different family search indexing projects as, as a coordinator back in the day. Right. Now, when it comes to other places, I remember state gen web sites Mm -hmm. as being places that you would handle their own uh, state uh, records for the U S federal census. This is not as true, it seems to me, these days as it was, but it seems to me like, I don't know, 10, 15, well, 15 years ago or something like that, that if I was really interested in Tennessee, I would go to the Tennessee Gen website and that there would be a desperate plea on, on the page saying, please come and index with us. And then I mm-hmm. would say, well, and I'm, while I'm at it, I really need to look at some stuff from Kentucky. And I would go to the Kentucky Gen Web site. I would be looking for the same family. And there would be a desperate plea there saying, please come and index with us. And they would, you know, all th- that and every single other state that I looked at would be showing that they had records that they needed handled. And they would be looking for captains for individual counties Mm -hmm. and um, that that was the way that a lot of people were handling indexing records, specifically state censuses and, um, and, and then sometimes the, the federal census for particular decades. Um, Obviously there are ways to index that are not just family search. Right. And then there are projects like Stacy's. What other kinds of places have you worked with and are you familiar with, I mean, online places that take, take a hand? Well, you know, and, and online indexing, that's, oh, I mean, Family Search is by far the, the largest. There are other projects like with the, I want to say the National Archives, and I forget the exact name of, of their project, but you can actually go and, and transcribe different records. Um, getting, getting material to be indexed via the web, via uh, volunteers who are, who are connecting on the internet is actually a pretty big, hairy deal. I mean, there is a lot that goes into that because unlike back in the day when I would mail out a packet with a disc and I would receive those back in the mail, well, with it's almost harder in a way to keep track of files because you have to name the file correctly because, you know, if and if somebody... And how do they how do they download them? How do they view them? What mechanism do you have to collect that information? You have to have some sort of web form or you know a Google Doc or something set up. So, you know, it's it's not as easy as okay, we're just going to scan this and people can index it remotely. There's a lot that goes behind it. Right now, I know that there is a new project that was just announced that the UNORC, UNORC, you'd be surprised considering I'm from here, how many times I say UNORC. The New York Historical Society has just announced that they have a project for land records, land and property records. Uh Uh-huh. And they are taking indexers. And that is very exciting. And so anybody who's interested in that, um, you can sign up. I believe that they have a Google form for signing up and go to the New York Historical Society for that. Reclaim the Records is about to have an indexing project. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure what it is yet. I can't remember. It's hard to keep track. They keep winning things. Yes, they, they do. just can't stop winning the winning. When will it end? And because they just can't stop winning, 
I can't keep track. Um, I remember that when she was on the show a couple months ago, uh, uh, the head of Brookshire Gans. Thank you. Brooke said that she was going to have for us all an opportunity to do a lot of indexing. Um, as I say, because I have not looked at the website in the past month or month and a half, maybe, to check specifically on whether or not that opportunity has come open, I'm not sure. But there's going to be an opportunity there. So there are things to do. And I do encourage people to go out there and get your hands dirty. It may take some looking. And quite honestly, if you want to be at any level, any kind of a researcher, it's good for you. Do it. Sometimes people come to me, you know, electronically and they say, where can I find such and so? And my answer is, you want to be a researcher? Google it. And that's what you got to do. You got to Google. <laughs> You got to do the research, folks. That's that's the way it works. Don't ask me to do your researching for you. I know how to research. Go for it, baby. Do it yourself. So there are there are projects out there, and um, I would I would encourage everybody to go find them because indexing is a great way to get to know what records look like. It's also, and I keep saying this, and I will continue to reiterate it. It's a great way to give back. To be an end user is wonderful. It means that you're doing something for your family. It means doing something for your friends or something for your clients or whoever it is that you're doing research for. And that's groovy. And I'm glad you're doing it. But you have to give back. Keep the universe in balance. And the only way to keep the universe in balance is to create more of what you're taking from. So that's why I think it's really important to pay attention to indexing and to arbitrating, as Amy said to me. So I'm going to stop <laughs> fetching about it and I'm going to start doing more indexing myself because honestly, I don't do a whole lot. I'm so busy running around maintaining, at this point, seriously, about 170 trees. I need to maybe pull back from that a little bit and start just indexing. I know some people who get into a Zen-like state mm -hmm. because that's what they do. <laughs> they well, index for peace. <laughs> well, and, and also the indexing on FamilySearch now, not only is it so much easier technologically, but they also learned a lot from the Civil War Soldiers and Sailors Project where one batch was 200 names. Boy. And and our 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 rallying cry was you can you can index a batch in an evening. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's inspiring. But but people did it. So then when when it when the when the whole program has evolved, and then by the time we got to the 1940 census, instead of having to index you know, 200 names of Civil War veterans, suddenly you are indexing one census page. That, that was one batch. You would download a single page. And what they found, and, and I found this to be true as, as somebody who was indexing, I think I'll sit down and I'll, I'll index the 1940 census. I, I'm, I'm just going to do one page. Okay, well, I'll do another one. Well, it wasn't so bad. Yeah, dinner's not going to be ready for another 15 minutes. Yeah, I'll do another one. You know, and people, it, it, it gave you that sense of accomplishment. So the batches now are a lot smaller than yep. back in the 90s when I was working on the, on the Civil War project. It's kind of like the Rice Krispie treats that I oh, made yeah. last week. Yeah. I made How were those? Oh, they were good. I um I cut them I cut them into um 12 squares. I ate 10 and I gave two away. I ate 10 of them in 2 days. 6 of them I ate in 1 day. And it started out with, you know, like one would taste good. I haven't had rice crispy squares in so long. I'm telling you, I have not had those things in years. 
at least not the homemade ones. I would, you know, like buy a bad cheap one, you know, in the Rice Krispie brand, you know, like at mm-hmm. the 7-Eleven. But this was, I needed to make them myself in my mom's pot on my mom's stove. And they tasted better because of it. And the thing was, it just started out with one and then it went to two. And mm-hmm. next thing you know, I ate six in bed with cats on my feet. Now, if that isn't decadent, I don't know what is. And you can do the same thing with your indexing. There's another thing that I will issue out, and here's a little more Latter-day Saint shaming. My, uh, my, this wasn't, wasn't the ward, was it? It was the stake. For those of you who don't know how my church is broken down, we're broken down in a kind of an interesting way. It is actually literally geographic. We go to church based on a geographically designed unit so that folks are close to one another so that we can do service for one another should a bad thing happen, should people be in need, uh, somebody gets sick or um, something happens, you know, in their life and they need meals or they need to be driven to the doctor or something like that. And I think that's really pretty cool. It's a nice way of taking care of your family. And so the smallest unit is a ward that would be comparable to like a uh, I don't know, the people you go to church with on Sunday, the people you go to shul with, uh, the people you go to masjid with, just basic unit. And then a bunch of words put together are a stake. And that would be, I don't know. I can't think what that's comparable to. I used to be Catholic. I, I should be. A diocese. Is that a diocese? Okay. It'd be a diocese. Okay. So that's like your diocese versus your parish. So in the stake that I was in back in Indianapolis, um, the stake decided to take on an indexing challenge. They decided that they really wanted to prove a particular point to themselves spiritually. They wanted to prove a particular point about their devotion to family history and their ancestors. And so they said, we're going to index the names of 10,000 ancestors as a stake, which meant something like five or six wards worth of people, which was, I don't know, two or 300 people per ward, something like that, adults per ward. And in that challenge period, they ended up indexing more like 70,000 names because people took that challenge seriously. Um, If you're a Latter-day Saint, what the heck, folks? We're heading in toward the end of the year. Take on, talk to your your stake president, talk to your, your bishopric, whatever. Take on a challenge. Any organization that you're in, Take on an indexing challenge. If, if you guys are at all interested in doing some kind of service and you know that everybody's into genealogy and family history these days, it's on TV, it's everywhere you look, take on an indexing challenge. It's not a hard thing to do intellectually. It's not like you have to learn 50,000 rules. Family Search, the website, leads you through it, as Amy said. Go for it. And, and it's really a lot of fun. It's cool. You can actually... Take popcorn with you, have some music playing, not like heavy metal that will, you know, or anything will make you want to sing along, but, you know, a little Bach or something like that in the background. And you can actually do it in a group and it's fun. And this is something that I think can bring a little community or a large community together. And this is the way that I look at indexing is it's a potential party. Um, I don't know. Well, you know. But, you know, it, it's interesting that, that you bring that up because I have seen cases, you know, of, of friends who have sort of challenged, they, they've had a challenge between either themselves and a teenage child or themselves and a teenage grandchild. Nice. It, it actually is a really, you wouldn't think that, that teenagers or preteens would get that interested in it, but yeah, give them any sort of level of competition and they are in. Ding, ding, ding. Next yeah. gen. I hear a next gen bell going off because people do ask that question. How do you bring the young people in? Well, what a great way to do that. That's awesome, Amy. I love that. Yeah, it's for my, for my friends that have done that. I mean, it's just been super successful. 
That's very cool. Now, we're going to transition very clumsily because I don't, have, <laughs> I don't have a smooth transition for this, but I'm going to bring us over to the other topic of the day. And that is, have you noticed the quality of Amy's sound? Hello have there. You- <laughs> Hello. <laughs> oh, knock my socks off. My goodness. Do you know why she has such great sound? Tell us why you have such great sound, Amy. Well, there, there's two reasons for that. The, the first is I, I bought a good microphone. You know, thank you, Amazon and Amazon Prime. Love two-day delivery. <laughs> so, I know Amazon Prime is like the, the most dangerous thing in my world. It One is. click buying. But the reason that I bought said microphone is because I'm launching a podcast. Dang, woman. <laughs> I'm getting on the podcast train. Can you handle it, folks? And when do you debut? I debut on Thursday, September 20th. So just a couple days from when we're recording this. Oh, this is so good. I feel so privileged that we can be announcing this. So tell me the name of the podcast. Tell us about it, what you're going to be doing. Okay, so the podcast is called Generations Cafe. And so... So not not to not to give anything away, but as as you might guess from the name, it's it's meant to be conversational and and just friendly and approachable. If you've ever been to any of my presentations at, at a conference or a seminar, I try not to do dry and stuffy. You know, I hated dry and stuffy in school, so it's like, yeah, not gonna try not to do that. So it's going to be conversational. It's going to be a mix of solo shows where I'm giving advice and insight on how to use different records, different resources that are out there, how to put them together, how to do good research, basically. And also bringing on some some colleagues and some experts in the field and getting their take on things. So, yeah. That sounds absolutely fantastic. And- I am. I'm super excited about it. And then we're going to have to cross over some because I want you to come back here and talk to us about more things, but I'd be happy to, I want everybody to listen to Amy's new show. I hope that you will, because I think that it's going to be fantastic. And I confess, I do not listen to a whole lot of podcasts. I will be listening to Amy's show every single episode. Absolutely. Thank Thank you. Because I'm one of your fangirls. <laughs> totally am your fangirl. And I can't <laughs> wait. So everybody, thank you for listening. And Amy, thank you for being here with us today. Thank you for having me. This has been great. You bet. Was that great fun or what? I am so excited to listen on Thursday to the debut of Generations Cafe, Amy's brand spanking new podcast. I'm subscribing. Are you? Be sure to look her up at amyjohnsoncrow.com and on Twitter and Instagram at amyjohnsoncrow. Also, she has a new online course, Beyond the Hints. I recommend following her on all platforms. She is so much fun, as you heard, and she really knows her stuff. Thanks so much for listening. Next week, we'll have a cookbook episode for you. And the week after that, I'm going to teach you a lesson. If you want to be on an episode of The Family Cookbook, let me know at ancestorsalivegenealogy.com. You'll also find links to Patreon and Kofi there or coffee or whatever the heck it's called. So you can become a financial supporter of the podcast for as little as a dollar a month. That's 25 cents a week, guys. Come on. Until next time, have a great week. Do your research. Don't be a Jeffrey. Give back at least as much as you take. And above all, expect surprises.